ओके सो वेलकम एवरीबॉडी टू साइट कोर यूजर ग्रुप इंडिया सेशन टुडे वी हैव रॉब विथ अस हु इज टेक्निकल एवेंजलिस्ट एट साइट कोर एंड टुडे ही विल बी प्रेजेंटिंग ऑन साइट कोर ऑन अजर कुबर नेटिज एंड इन दिस सेशन ही विल बी कवरिंग हाउ यू कैन रन साइट कोर इन कंटेनर्स ऑन ए के एस so uh, let's join us to learn about this and if you have any questions please uh, post it in chat window to me alok or brijesh we are the host of this session and yeah that's it so over to you rob awesome thanks for having me i'm assuming you can all hear me okay yeah we can hear you awesome okay so i'm just going to turn my camera off while i'm presenting so i can make sure we got enough bandwidth for the presentation itself and i probably need to share my screen first okay so as was mentioned i'm going to where does that disappear to i'm going to cover today running psycho on azure kubernetes service otherwise known as aks my name is rob ellum i'm a technical evangelist with psycho been working with the company for about 5 years now in a couple of different roles and what you see before you is a picture of me before the isolation started i now have much more hair and a bigger beard so i don't look like that anymore um, so i'm not really going to talk too much about what containers are today we've kind of covered that in a lot of other sessions uh, there's lots of content out there already, already available on places like our master site core youtube channel really just want to focus on kubernetes itself and microsoft's implementation of that So just to begin with a basic introduction to Kubernetes if you go to the Kubernetes documentation site this is the explanation of what Kubernetes is they describe it as a portable extensible open source platform for managing containerized workloads and services it facilitates both declarative configuration and automation and has a large rapidly growing ecosystem Kubernetes supports Kubernetes services support and tools are widely available It was originally open source back in Google um in around 2014 I think it was and you may sometimes see the name Kubernetes written as KHS as it is in the header here and it might look a bit strange at first but that's purely because Kubernetes is quite a long name and there are eight characters in between the K and the S which is how they came up with that abbreviation so that description's pretty good but it's quite an abstract way of describing Kubernetes it doesn't really describe what it is uh, why we need it or or how it works so let's start off with why you need it so containers are a great way to bundle and run your applications but in a production environment you need to manage the containers that run the applications to ensure that there's no downtime for example if a container goes down another container needs to be spun up and started in its place kubernetes provides you with the framework to be able to run distributed systems based on containers in a resilient way like that and there's some key features that it does that basically enables that the first is service discovery and load balancing so kubernetes allows you to expose containers using dns names or ips and if traffic to a container is high kubernetes lets you load balance and distribute the network network traffic to ensure that your deployment remains stable it enables storage orchestration which means you can automatically mount a storage system of your choice that could be local disks public cloud providers and many many more besides it enables automated rollouts and rollbacks and it does this through the concept of state basically um what you do is you tell kubernetes a, de a desired state that you want to create and kubernetes will then go and change the actual state to match the desired state but crucially it'll do it at a controlled rate So for example you can automate kubernetes to create new containers for your deployment and remove existing containers for you. I love this one as well. It's also self-healing. <laughs> um it'll restart containers that fail. It it'll replace containers that die. It'll kill containers that don't respond to health checks that you define yourself. And it'll also it won't allow traffic to hit a container until they are ready to actually serve traffic. And we'll see all this in action shortly. And the last one is really crucial it's um secret and configuration management. So Kubernetes lets you manage secret um sensitive information things like passwords, OAuth tokens, SSH keys. 
And you can deploy and update these configuration items without having to actually rebuild your container images. And that's really important. And that's what basically enables you to use the same container image throughout all of your different environments. You don't have to rebuild it doing transforms like you used to have to previously when working um, and installing directly to the bare metal. So let's start to look at some of the key concepts around Kubernetes. The, I suppose like the largest concept you'll have is, is the concept of a cluster. A cluster represents a single Kubernetes setup, if you like. It is the foundation of Kubernetes. Everything else that you create, which we talk about, will all be deployed into a cluster. And all your containerized applications that you'll deploy will run on this cluster. You may have more than one cluster. Uh, I talked about the concepts of environments a minute ago. You could have a cluster for your development, a cluster for your staging, a cluster for your production. That's a perfectly valid setup. Inside your cluster, you have the concept of nodes. And a node is the actual compute, the, the actual worker machines that, um, that handles all of the resources that you're going to deploy there. In AKS, we're going to look at surely, surely that's um, using IaaS VMs under the hood. So that's the concept of a node. Each node is an IaaS virtual machine. A pod is basically, it's like the smallest unit that you can actually deploy in Kubernetes. So a pod will contain one or more containers. And each of those containers needs to be closely tied together if you're going to deploy more than one. And you can then scale your pods out horizontally. So you can have two, three, four pods doing the same job and load balance the traffic between them. You can't scale the individual containers within a pod though. We have the concept of a deployment. And this is where we start to get into the concept of desired and actual state. So a deployment is basically a set of instructions that you give to Kubernetes. And you're basically saying, as the example shows here, I want to set up three pods running my application. And you define that in a YAML document, not just in speech marks, but um, you pass that over to Kubernetes and it'll then go and create the pods that match what you've just asked for. Underpinning this all um, is the concept of a container. As I said, we're not gonna dig too much into containers today. There's a lot of content out there already on those. Um, containers are basically a layered way to distribute your application including things like its configuration and runtime and everything else it needs to actually run. Once you've got your pods and your containers deployed out to a node, you need to actually expose them to traffic, both internally. Um, so Kubernetes will create internal networks to allow pods to communicate and also externally to allow traffic to be able to access your pods from outside. And this is done through the concept of a service. So a service is an abstract way of exposing an application running on one or more pods as a network service. And it basically allows traffic to come in, hit that service, and then be balanced between the different pods that that service expo exposes. If that traffic is coming from the outside world, it'll come through an ingress. An ingress is basically kind of like a window is like the way I like to view it. Um, Kubernetes is like this box you have and an ingress is a window that allows traffic to enter the box. Um, it typically handles things like host name resolution. So you'll have a series of host headers that are mapped internally to different services. So on this diagram here, we have two different services, most likely handled by two different host names. A great example with Sitecore would be, for example, your CM and your CD, they'd be on different pods different host names, different services, and the ingress would split those. It also is typically used for HTTPS termination. So typically you don't have traffic passing along securely within the Kubernetes network because it is an internal network. It is um, not available to the outside world anyway. So you typically have HTTPS terminated at your ingress point. The last thing we have is the concept of a namespace. And um, a namespace is, it's a way to basically group a set of resources within a Kubernetes cluster. In my head, <laughs> I, I kind of like to think of them as similar to a resource group in Azure. So it allows you to basically group together all one set of objects that are all kind of related to each other. I talked before about having different clusters for each environment. 
A different approach to that would be to have a different namespace for each environment. Again, perfectly valid. You could have a much larger cluster. And in that case, have a namespace containing all of your staging objects, for example, and a, names a namespace containing all of your other non-production instances. You probably wouldn't mix non-prod and prod together, but it's valid to have different architectures deployed on one cluster. I touched on the concept of secrets before. So as I said, you don't want to store things like credentials, passwords, API keys, and other secrets in, in your source control and, and in your containers, because it makes it more difficult to change those should the need arise. Instead, what you want to do is store those values externally to your images and pass them in at runtime through things like environment variables. Speaking from a Sitecore example perspective, these are things like your database connection details, your identity secrets, your certificate details, your license information, things you don't want to bake directly into your actual container images. As I said before, one of the big advantages to passing these in at runtime is that you can use the same image you build for all of your environments, from your local development machine all the way up to production. You don't have to keep doing uh, rebuilds and transforming co um, configuration files anymore. You basically just pass in a different set of environment variables at runtime. Okay, so this is all a little bit abstract. I understand this. Um, hopefully, as we go through it, it's going to become a little bit more clear. I do have a few more slides to go through before we actually start to look at this in action. I just want to kind of show how some of these different concepts hang together. So when you start off with Kubernetes, you start off with a control plane. And you will have one or more instance of these to provide high availability. This is where the actual Kubernetes um, code functions. It has to run on Linux. So in Sitecore's example, we run on Windows containers. But you will still need at least one Linux node to be able to run your control plane, most likely two if you need high availability. After that, we introduce the concept of nodes. As we said, this is where our pods and our containers are actually going to run. Each of these nodes, as you can see, has a kubelet installed, which is what the control plane uses to interact with that node. And it also has a container runtime. In our case, and in most cases, that's Docker. Next, we start by issuing and running a deployment. As we said, this is basically a specification of a desired state. This is showing, it's basically telling Kubernetes how to configure our pods and our services and our ingress and various other things. So Kubernetes will receive that deployment and it'll then create the, the number of pods that we've requested. In this example, you can see we've created a single pod, which is what the blue line represents. And that single pod contains a single container. Finally, we want other pods within our uh, cluster to be able to access that. So we're also going to include a service in our deployment requests. But it could get more complicated than that. Let's say, for example, our deployment said, I needed two instances of that pod. Then Kubernetes will basically scale that across your different nodes. The key thing to notice here, though, is that notice how the pod is, we have a pod on node one and a pod on node two but we still only have a single service. They are both exposed under a single uh, internal IP and the traffic's balanced between the two. And you can really scale this out further and further. In this example, we have five pods split between node one, node two, and node three, still all only with a single container inside, but still all wrapped in that single service. So this is, Kubernetes we've been talking about so far. Uh, we haven't really touched on AKS yet. So AKS is Microsoft's managed Kubernetes service. And by managed, it basically means that they take some of the pain for you. They, they actually handle some of the, um, the issues, well, not issues, but some of the difficulties you can have with running a Kubernetes cluster by standing up all of these things yourselves. One of the key things around this is the concept of elastic provisioning. So as I mentioned before, AKS is based on the concept, uh, well, its nodes are underpinned on the concept of IaaS VMs in Azure. Much in the same way as you can have elastic provisioning for your PaaS web apps, you can have the same thing in your AKS instance. You can specify that you want your IaaS VMs 
I want a minimum of two and a maximum of 15, for example. And dependent on the workload that's happening in your AKS instance, uh, AKS will automatically provision and deprovision those VMs to make sure that there's enough compute power in your cluster to be able to handle the amount of workload that it needs to get through. It has a really nice integration with VS Code. So you can access and view all of your different resources directly from within your IDE. As a developer, that's, that's a really powerful way to work. It has a super tight integration with Azure Active Directory. So if you're working with a customer who already uses AAD throughout a lot of their other systems, this is just gonna slot really nicely in with their existing identity management functionality. It's available across the globe, 36 regions last time I checked. <laughs> it may be more now. So double check before you go try and deploy, but it's available in the vast majority of regions today. And crucially for Sitecore, it is now both available with Linux and Windows nodes. Sitecore obviously requiring Windows nodes to be able to run. And that brings us to Sitecore on AKS. So what is available today? If you go to dev.sitecore.net, you can download a full set of Kubernetes specifications and a complete installation guide. That will take you from having a running AKS instance basically completely empty to the full path of installing Sitecore and getting it to the point where you can hit your main welcome to Sitecore page and the, um, the concept management interface. And this is what I'm gonna show you shortly. Do just quickly before that, I wanna to touch on what isn't, isn't supported. So we have two different types of containers we've issued. We have the application containers, which are things like your CM, CD, identity server, X Connect instances, basically all the apps. They're fully supported. You can go and run those today on AKS and full support is provided for those. Where it gets a little different is around the data storage containers. So we issued containers for SQL, Solar and Redis. If you've looked at those already, you'll see that in the non-production namespace. So those are not supported. So you need to create a plan for how you're going to run your data storage in production. You could, for example, still use Azure SQL and Azure Redis and things like this. You could go and stand up your own solar VM instance or use a PaaS solar provider. What we're saying is we're not saying you can't run these instances in containers. If you're fully Kubernetes AKS experience, you're used to running data storage roles in containers, you can go and create your own SQL containers and stand these up today. They do have to be in a separate node pool compared to your application containers. Well, that makes sense. So I haven't touched too much on node pools yet. And a node pool is basically one set of auto scaling VMs. You can't scale um, a node pool to have different size machines in it. It just gives you a certain amount of the same size machines. And different VMs in Azure are configured for different workloads. You will use a different VM to run a SQL instance compared to an application instance because its requirements are very different. So you would want to use a different node pool anyway. So, so that definitely does make sense. Okay, I kind of waffled on for a little bit about that. I think it's time we probably saw some of this in action. So I'm gonna hop over and I'm gonna load up VS Code. And I've got a solution here and we can see I've got this Kubernetes folder. And in here, I have a series of specification files. And these basically define all the different objects that I need to run to be able to stand up a Kubernetes instance in AKS. I'm just gonna talk through some of them. I'm not gonna go through all of them because there's heaps. <laughs> but I wanna start with the external ones. And these are the non-production ones I just mentioned, SQL, Redis, and Solar. So if we look in here, you can see each of these has basically two elements defined in it. The first is the service. So we wanna expose this SQL container to other containers, sorry, this SQL pod to other pods in our, um, in our cluster. So we define a service for that. We give it a name. So we're saying that this pod here, these pods will be available under the name MS SQL and on the port 1433, the standard SQL port. After that, we then define our deployment. Remember the deployment defines the desired state that we want to, that we want Kubernetes to create for us. We give it some labels, and then afterwards, we define our spec. 
the spec basically says what it is we want to create. In this case, we're creating one pod. So we only want one SQL pod. <clears throat> we keep going down and we get down to our node selector. That's the next interesting piece. Uh, we say it needs to run a Windows. We're running a SQL version of Windows. There are Linux ones available, but in our example case, we're running a SQL one. And then we get down to the actual container definition. So here you can see, this is just the standard SQL XP instance, which we released with V10. Notice, as I said, it's in the non-production instance. You can't, you can't deploy this container out to prod, but what I'm showing you here is perfectly valid for a non-production instance. And then we, we pass in some environment variables. Here you can see we have some secret data. As I mentioned before, we have all of our secrets stored externally to the actual containers themselves. So this is where we're specifying our Sitecore SQL database password. I think this is a great point to go and take a look at those secrets then. If we look in the folder here, we can see I have a secrets folder. And in here, I basically have a heap of different text documents. And each of those text files represents a single secret. So if we look at this customization.yaml, this is basically there to group these secrets into kind of related buckets, if you like. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You can see we have a bucket for the Sitecore admin password, which just defines a single secret. Sitecore admin.txt. If we look in there, we can see everyone's favorite admin password. If we go back to that customization again. You can see uh, the database ones is a good example. We have a bucket called Sitecore database, which has all the different database passwords in here. So things like our collection shard mapper, core database, EXM, all the different database usernames and passwords. And we can go and look at them again in the text document. Here's my core database password. You can go down and see your forms database username, all of these different values. Basically everything you're gonna pass in at runtime is defined in a secret though. So things like your license file, it gets um, encoded and stored as basically encoded values in here because you can't actually pass in a file. So you just pass it in in, in, its, in its encoded formats at runtime. So let's take a look at a different spec now. Let's, let's continue on these uh, external ones. Let's take a look at Redis. And you should start to notice a pattern here. Again, we define our service. Here we go. We have a service for Redis. It's going to be exposed to the other pods in our cluster. After that, we have a deployment again defined saying how we want to create this Redis instance. It again runs on Windows. And here you can see our container image. It's our XP Redis image. Okay, so after you've installed your external, um, your external deployments, we have this concept of initialization um, <clears throat> specs. And this is something else we need to talk about. So the Solar and the SQL deployments that get created, they're, they're completely empty. So we need to initialize them before Sitecore can use them. <clears throat> so what we have here is we have this concept of a job. And a job is basically a, a special kind of pod that gets deployed. And it has a workload that it needs to complete. And when that workload is finished, the pod is automatically taken down by Kubernetes and it's closed off. <clears throat> in the SQL, sorry, in the solar case here, that is going to go through and it's going to create all of our index definitions. We have exactly the same for SQL. In that case, it's going to go through and create all of the different SQL tables for us. After that, we have all of the different application elements. So I'm not going to go through all these again. We'll just take a look at the CD one. But again, very similar compared to the other ones. You can see we have a service declared. So our CD instance is going to be <clears throat> exposed on this service. We then have our deployment. We have a single CD instance. And we can go down and see all the different variables and the image that's defined. Heaps of different environment variables for the CD, all the different uh, databases it needs to connect to, all different instances it needs to hit. So XDB, lots of different configuration. It's probably a good time to talk about liveness and readiness. So there's two different concepts in Kubernetes. Liveness basically signifies that a container has been created. It is alive but it's not actually ready to receive traffic yet. Um, that's what readiness means. And we have these two endpoints with Sitecore version 10, which you can hit. And basically Kubernetes will ping these every um, 
30 seconds is what we configured it to do. Um, when the slash health Z slash live endpoint gives a 200 response, then Kubernetes knows that, knows that container is alive. So that's step one done. After that's finished, it'll start hitting the readiness endpoint, health Z ready. When it gets a 200 from ready, it knows the container's alive, it's ready, and it's ready to receive traffic. So at that point, the service will start sending traffic through to it. The last thing I want to touch on is the ingress. Um, yeah, so this is basically where we define the configuration for Nginx for how to map our host names to a specific service. In this case, we're just using a host name of cd.globalhost. And we're saying that when any traffic arrives at my, basically my window into my cluster on that host name, forward it all to the service called CD. Remember the service called CD that we just looked at is what wraps our CD pod. So that is, that is basically the gateway to our, our CD containers, if you like. So any traffic that comes in on that host name will get passed over to CD on port 80. The same for cm.globalhost. We'll go through to the CM service, id.globalhost will go through to the identity server, um, identity server service. Right, okay. <laughs> That's a lot of YAML. Um, let's start to have a look at this. Let's try and get some of this working. Let's try and deploy Sitecore. Okay, so I have a PowerShell window here. I'm in that Kubernetes folder. We can see the exact same YAML documents we were just looking at. Ahead of time, I have already stood up an AKS instance um, just to save some time. It's not a long process to do that. It takes maybe 10 to 15 minutes, something like that. But um, it's not very entertaining to sit and watch at a user group conference. So <clears throat> I did that ahead of time this morning. Once your Kubernetes instance is up and available, you interact with it using the Kube Control API. And that's basically how you can control your entire cluster. And it's how we're going to start to deploy our application elements. So I'm going to start. And I'm going to say I want to apply a configuration to my Kubernetes instance. It's a set of file-based applications. So I'll use the F toggle. And I'm going to start by deploying everything in the external folder. Remember, they were the, um, they were the data storage roles. And we get a response back saying we have created the service for SQL, the deployment for SQL, the service for Redis, the deployment for Redis, service for Solar, the deployment for Solar. <clears throat> so that's pretty good. But remember I said, we've just kind of told Kubernetes what to do. We still need to check this worked. So to do that, I need to turn off caps lock. But uh, we can use Q control. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, get me all deployments. This is now going to give me a list of all deployments that have been made to the default namespace, which is just what I'm using here. And we can see I have my three deployments, SQL, Redis, and Solar. And this says that I requested one pod to be created and one pod is ready. Same for Redis, same for Solar. So we can do the same. We can go and look at the actual pods themselves. And here you can see, you get the name and Kubernetes will just basically generate a string at the end randomly to identify it. But we can see we requested one and what is ready, one is available. Okay, that was pretty easy. So next up, remember I said, we need to do the initialization step, the init. So Let's do that. Uh, okay, cube control. I'm going to apologize in advance if my typing goes horrible because it always does when I'm doing live demos. <laughs> so again, we're going to apply a configuration. We're going to do a file-based configuration with the F toggle. And we're going to do everything in the init folder this time. That is my SQL init. And that is my solar init. It's going to go and initialize my solar um, indexes, and it's going to go and initialize my SQL databases for me. Now, I just want to talk through something while these run in the background. I basically, before this, went and completed this whole task, and then basically went and deleted everything, uh, ready so it's fresh and clean to do again. And there's a reason I did that. So how Kubernetes works under the hood here is that it's referencing those different images I talked about. Remember, we looked at um, CD, for example. It was pointing to this image definition somewhere. Hey, so it's pointing to this CD image. So when I tell it to create a deployment, which has a pod in it, 
which contains this image. What Kubernetes needs to do is it needs to go over to that container registry and pull that image down. And it has a local container registry inside the Kubernetes cluster where it gets stored. So the first time you run this, it's probably going to be heaps slower than when I show you this because it's got to download those images. Because I did this ahead of time already and deleted the Kubernetes objects, it's already got those images cached, which is just a quicker way of making these demos a bit faster. Let's see how we're going. So we can do Kubernetes, kube control, get jobs. Remember these two init containers are jobs. They're a kind of special kind of, um, special kind of container, a special kind of pod, sorry. Oh, so we can see one's runs completion. We have solar in it. Uh, it's run one time and it's completed. SQLs, we've requested one and it hasn't quite yet. So let's take a look at kube control. Oh, get pods again. Now we're doing the get pods. As I said, jobs are just a special type of pod. So they'll appear in here. And we can see that we have the solar in it defined here and it has completed. There we go. So it's got a zero for running pods. And we can take a look at what it's actually done under the hood. Again, we can use kube control. This time I'm going to use the logs command. And all of these containers are configured to basically push all their logs to what's called standard out. And that means that if you're using Docker or Kubernetes, you can use things like these logs command and it'll just read the logs of directly what's happening. So this is already finished. So we can just get what logs are in there. I need to copy that name. And this will tell us what happened inside that, um, inside, that, inside that job. So we can scroll up, we can see it created a lot of stock work configurations and then went through and configured all of the different site core indexes that we have. FXM, core, master, all the indexes you're used to. Okay, so let's see how that other job's going along. Pod. Um, okay, that's still running. Let's see where it's up to. So what we can do now is we can go cube control. We're going to do logs again. This time we're going to use the F flag. Um, that's basically going to say we want to follow the logs. Similar to, it's also called tailing. Uh, so it basically means it's not just going to output the log and then return us to the command prompt. It's going to basically tie us to that output and continue to show what's actually happening. Oh, I think it just finished as I entered that. Um, if it was still running, it would have tied us to it. But we can look up here and we can see all these different database actions. All the databases have been created. And then it's created all the users we needed. And finally, it set our super secure admin password at the end. Okay, so let's clear this first. Control, get pods. Okay, so we have our SQL pod. It's running, it's initialized. Redis is fine as it is. We have our solar pod running, initialized. Our SQL init has run and completed. Our solar init has run and completed. Okay, that's, that's everything we need to do with our data storage roles. They're ready for some site core applications to pump some data in there. So let's do it, let's see what happens. Okay, so kube control again. I want to apply some configurations. They are file-based. And if you remember, all the application roles were just in the root of this Kubernetes directory that I'm already in. So I'm just going to say dot current location. So I'm going to say kube control, apply my configurations, their file base, and I'm in the folder I want to run. Go. Here we go. Okay. Um, this is an XP1 instance. So <clears throat> there's quite a few roles involved. And we can see, we can start to look through them here. You can see we have our service for our CD and our deployment for our CD. <clears throat> we have our CM, uh, Cortex, a few different roles of Cortex, identity server. We've got a uh, processing, reporting. Um, then we've got all of our different XDB roles. Okay, this is going to start to put Kubernetes under a bit of work. So let's see what is going on. We can do kube control, get deployment again. Let's just double check the deployments we asked it to run. Oh, here we go. They're all here and running. You can see we've requested just one pod for each of these and there are none ready yet. Of course, there aren't. it's only run for 39 seconds. This is gonna take a few minutes to run. Luckily, I've got a few things to show you in the meantime. You can also check on the pods to see uh, the state of those two. 
excuse me. And um, yeah, they're all running now. So some of these are up and running, some of these the in it, I'll come back to shortly. Um, I think this is probably a good time to hop over to the Azure portal and take a look in there and just see what it is we're actually working with. So as I said before, ahead of time, I already created this um, AKS instance and it's this REA Sorg India 2 instance here. <clears throat> when we look in this resource group, let's move that back a bit. You can see I have two elements. I have a container registry, which if I was building local images, I would be pushing all of my images into. And then I have my Kubernetes service, my AKS instance itself. What happens when you create an AKS instance though? You don't just get this element here. You also get an entirely extra resource group. And the cool thing about AKS is it's all pinned by Azure resources that you're kind of really used to if you've used Azure a lot. Um, so if we look in this resource group, you can see what I mean. Let's move that out of the way again. So here we can see we've got a set of virtual machine scale sets. So these are the VM scale, scale units that I talked about before. These are what our nodes are. So this is the default one, the node pool here. That's my Linux one, which my, um, which my control plane is running on. And then I have this a AKS NP win, which is my Windows node pool. So all my different containers that are spinning up as we speak, they're all running on a couple of VMs inside this scale set. We have, what else do we have here? We have my public IP address. That is my ingress. My window into my cluster is backed by an Azure public IP. And we have things like standard network security group information, networking and other things, which basically is pretty standard Azure stuff. So let's jump back into the actual AKS instance itself. I know some people aren't a huge fan of working with a command line. Um, <clears throat> anyone who saw my user group presentation for um, Southeast Asia last month would have shown, would have seen me show the Azure dashboard. Uh, sorry, the Kubernetes dashboard. Recently, AKS upgraded to 1.19. With that upgrade, the Kubernetes dashboard is no longer supported with AKS. It won't work. I tried the other day and um, that was when I learned that it doesn't work. Instead, Microsoft wants you to use the portal here and you can get exactly the same data. So if we look on the Kubernetes resources here, I can see all my different namespaces that are in there. The default namespace is the one we're currently deploying to. If I go into my workloads here, here you can see, I'm just gonna define this back to my default namespace so we can define it down a bit. Here we can see all of the different um, deployments we have. Oof, they're starting to come up pretty quickly actually. We're still waiting on processing CDCM. Um, I could tab along to the pods. Here we can see, let me just define that by default again. Again, we're still waiting CD, CM. There we go, this is looking pretty good. They're starting to come up now, they're running. Um, okay, what else did I wanna show you in here? Oh, the other cool thing about these is, is the node pools itself. I spoke earlier on about the concept of elastic provisioning in AKS and how that's really important. Here's where you can figure that. I mentioned before the two VM scale sets in that other resource group. This is where they're tied to the AKS instance. <clears throat> so here you can see my Windows one, and my Linux one. And if we go into here, we can choose scale. And currently I just have it set to two nodes, but you could choose to auto scale it. If I was a hugely busy site, I could say I want a minimum of 577 and a maximum of 927. And then my bank balance would be screaming at me. But uh, you can see that you can scale these like seriously, seriously high. So a lot of compute available to you. Let's not approve that. Uh, my boss will shout at me. Uh, <laughs> okay, let's hop back to the command prompt and see how these pods are looking. Uh, Q control, yeah. Let's... Okay, running, 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 running. Oh, wow. It looks like they're all pretty much up and running. I didn't expect that. I was a little faster than I thought it was going to be. Okay. Let's try it. Let's see if I can hit a CD. Yeah, let's try CD first. And let's just see how many let's have. Oh, 
Okay, that looks pretty good. So at the minute, obviously, these instances are just warming up, just like your typical Sitecore instance if you were deployed locally or in the cloud. It takes a little few minutes just to actually get up and running. And here we go. We have my running CM instance, CD instance here, sorry. And that's an annoying thing that's in the way there from Zoom. Let's not touch that. <laughs> and here's my CM. I can log into the interface through the ID server. I get one password out of the way. It takes a little bit for the CM to warm up again. But you can see how simple and easy it was for me to create a full scaled XP1 instance. I mean, I think that was, when did I test that? Here we go. Five minutes, 41 seconds ago. And all of my XP instances were up and running. That's crazily fast to go from basically a clean instance all the way up to fully scaled. I mean, if we include the application ones as well, it's 12. 12 minutes, so from bare metal AKS to fully running Sidecore, which is fantastic. Okay, um, what else did I want to show you? Oh yeah, so I mentioned before that the Kubernetes dashboard is no longer supported. What I discovered about two hours ago, there is another version that you can use. So I wanted to show you that. It's called, give it a that. Um, it's called KA Dash. Um, so what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to open up another PowerShell window here. I'm going to enter command here for port forward. And I installed this ahead of time. And basically, I have a service here in front of a deployment, much in the way, same way as Sitecore. And the service is called K8 Dash. It's in the kube system namespace. And what this is saying here, it's going to do a port forward from my local machine directly into my Kubernetes cluster, which is awesome. So it's basically going to expose port 9999 on my local laptop to be wired directly to port 80 on this service internally in my cluster. So we can run that and there we go, it's connected. So I can go over to my browser now, I can open up a new tab and we can go localhost 9999. And bang, there we go. We now have a Kubernetes dashboard, which is running in the cloud there. And uh, again, I just like this. It's a nicer, more graphical version compared to the Azure dashboard. One cool thing about this as well is it'll auto refresh. So you don't have to manually refresh things. So I'll tell you what, let's, let's give that a go. Let's try it out. Um, if I move this down to the bottom, I mentioned before about um, self-healing in Kubernetes. So I could go and kill an instance in here and Kubernetes will rebuild it. So let's, let's test that. Uh, let's clear this down first, if I can spell properly. Okay, let's do cube, troll, get pods. Let's kill my CD instance. So obviously normally in a production environment, you'd have more than one CD. So your other CD instances would, um, would take over the traffic. But in this case, I've only got the one. So, for that moment, for this time, my CD is going to be down. But let's, let's, yeah, let's kill it. We can use delete, cube control, delete pod, and this one. Bang. Okay. Instant update. You see the graph has changed in the background. Only 19 of my 20 workloads are now available. If I try and hit my CD, service temporarily down. I've killed that pod. It's no longer there at all. You can see here that Kubernetes is deleting the old one. Let's go to that dashboard instead and view it. Uh, yeah, we're in the default namespace. And here we go. We can see now we have an issue. CD is 10 minutes old, but we don't have a pod. We've requested one, but they are currently non available. So I think, can we click on it to get a bit more detail? Here we go. So here we go. We can see we have a replica set. We've got a pod here. It's only 36 seconds old. So Kubernetes is trying to recreate it. Let's take a look at that in action. Oh, get pods. Okay, here we go. You can see the old one has completely disappeared. If I'd done that a bit quicker, it would have come up here saying terminating, but it's already gone. It's already taken it out of the no pool. It's been decommissioned. Um, now we're basically, we're just waiting for this one to come up. It'll take a couple of minutes, but um, I might not wait around for it too long. 
Yeah, but um, as you can see, it takes a little bit of time for Kubernetes to warm it up. If you had a low balanced environment, your service would have taken over at this point. It would be serving traffic down to your other CD instances. And naturally they'd be coming under a little bit more load. But the advantage is that Kubernetes will detect that the actual state of its cluster doesn't match what you originally requested. We originally requested a single CD instance and we then killed it. So we removed that CD instance and <clears throat> it was no longer available. I think it's just actually come alive. So we see that in the background. And hopefully if we hit this now, it's just gonna warm up again. We're not getting the 503 at least, so that's good. And Kubernetes, you can see, has basically recreated that workload for me. I haven't had to do anything. All I did is actually kill the container itself. And Kubernetes like just went away and self-healed, recreated it all for me. Whew. Okay. Uh, I think that's probably all the demo I had for you today. Um, let's quickly hop back to slides, and then I'll have a little bit of time, some questions at the end. Just want to finish yeah, with some closing thoughts. So Kubernetes, as I said, has been around, or well, Google open sourced it back in 2014. So it's been around for a while. There's a really, really rich ecosystem around it. The tooling's fantastic. Things like K8 Dash and all the different um, tools are available for there for you to use. Make sure you're leveraging them. There's a heap of industry knowledge out there, which is perfectly, um, really important and viable for, the, for running Sitecore. Next, make sure you secure your cluster. This is just the same as if you're running in IaaS, PaaS, anywhere. AKS, if you're running in Azure Kubernetes service, or if you're standing up your own Kubernetes instances, you need to make sure you secure it, just the same as you do running any site. Plan for how you're going to do your data storage. Are you going to use Azure SQL and um, <clears throat> a PaaS Solar and Azure Redis and things like that? Or are you going to roll your own um, SQL containers? Or maybe you'll stand up an IaaS instance for SQL. All of those are valid options. You just need to plan ahead of time and figure out what you, what best suits your needs and experience. For further reading, Microsoft has a fantastic set of best practices on AKS. I definitely recommend taking a look at those. And also, we well, a couple of months back, we open sourced a rebuild that we're doing currently. The MVP site is the site for the SiteCore MVP program. And myself and the rest of the technical marketing team are in the process of rebuilding it. We're rebuilding it using containers, we're deploying to AKS, and it's all open source. So there's a full like CI CD pipeline showing how you can get your solution from your development machine built in an automated fashion all the way into AKS. So you can definitely just take that today as an example to build off. Um, hopefully it's really useful. And I think that's probably everything I had to show you today. Um, Okay, I think it's probably time for questions. I'll probably stop sharing now and put my camera back on so you can see me. Any questions? Yeah, so we have got uh, many questions in chat window. Uh, first is, uh, may I know why data storage containers need to be a different node pool? This is from Sri Harsha. Yeah, sure. so basically the different, as I showed before, you have the different VM scale sets uh, that back your Kubernetes cluster. And you can't have different types of VMs in one scale set. You basically say, I want a VM scale set and it's gonna be um, a specific tier of VM in Azure. And then you say, I want X amount of those within the threshold or a solid amount, a fixed amount. But because you can't put different tiers in there, you can't use the specified, um, the specialist VMs. Azure has different VMs for running uh, processor heavy applications, like a CD instance, compared to like disk heavy applications, like a SQL instance. So you'd want to have them in different node pools because they're designed for different purposes, really. Next is, is there any plan to support the data storage container in future? Yes, we are definitely working on that. Um, this is our first official container release uh, we are where we're supporting it. So we are basically following steps the same as you are. Um, we're working on it for a future release for sure. 
next uh, what about the support on other orchestration services like service fabric cluster and service fabric mesh well that's one of the advantages to containerization uh, you can take your containers and you can run them wherever you have a container runtime really as long as it can run windows containers and as long as i think you need to be able to run uh, well you need to be able to get the correct version of windows as well to match the host os because a lot of them require process isolation I didn't go into my isolation mode too much in this. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, you can take your containers and you can run them in AKS, you can run them in AWS, you can run them in Google Cloud. There's different ways to run containers within um, Azure itself. That's the beauty of containers. I mean, it opens up so many different options for you. I will say that AKS is what we've tested. So if you want to go and use an alternative provider, then there will be a bit of uh, figuring things out yourself, trying to get things up and running. But um, yeah, go for it. Next is, uh, can we also use Istio for service mesh? That's a good question. Um, it's not something we've tested. Uh, I haven't done too much with Istio myself. Um, it'd be a fantastic POC to give it a try though. L let me know if you do. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, next is uh, the manifest looks executing in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, is there any dependencies need similar to XP0? So the images do have dependencies within each other. It'll run through and basically execute each of those in an alphabetical order because that's just the order that they're in the folder when you basically call the cube control apply. But um, I didn't actually go into that really. In the definitions themselves, for example, the CDN instance will have a set of init containers specified. Uh, what that basically says is, I as a container, I'm a C con CM container, I can't say that I'm ready until these other containers say they're ready. So we'll have dependencies on things like SQL, XConnect, Cortex. And that's how you basically get around the thing being deployed alphabetically, but then only coming up when its dependency graph has actually been rendered out properly. Uh, next is, what is the worker node capacity requirement to run CMCD environment for production workload? What is the, what, sorry? What is what the, the worker node that? worker node capacity requirement to run CM or CD environment ah. for production workload? Um, we are work yeah, so we're working on getting some performance metrics out. Basically, we hope to have those out soon. Our performance team's working on them. What we recommend currently is just to work off our existing PaaS document for 9.3. Um, <clears throat> everything we've seen so far says that will probably be over spec So you should be able to get a reduction in compute requirements below that. But we just, we need to make sure we've got it kind of nailed down before we release proper guidelines. But they're coming, they're on the way. Next is uh, coming to the self-healing. Do you suggest mounting website route out to local or Azure storage for data persistence? Um, it depends what it is you want to persist. So containers have their own persistence inside. They have their own root file system. All the assets are stored in there. Um, if you have elements that are basically like user generated, maybe that wouldn't be persisted inside a container, you could persist them out to um, Azure storage, like you say, or um, Kubernetes itself has the concept of a, what's it called that? It's called like persistent storage, I think it is or something, where you can store them externally to containers again. Um, again, it depends on what the reason is you're storing the information outside of a database or outside of a container itself, but it, it is possible, yep. Uh Next is uh, what Psycho recommendation for multi CD containers considering worker node can go down or reboot it for different reasons or for redundancy or load sharing? Yeah, so in production, you 100% need more than one CD instance. As I showed you then, uh, when your CD goes down, if you just have one of them, your site's down. So you need multiple CD instances, you need to performance test your implementation for the expected workload that your site is due to receive to let yourself know how many CDs you need to serve that amount. You also need a bit of redundancy in there because if one of those CDs goes down, you don't want your site performance and speed to degrade. But what Azure will, I'm sorry, what Kubernetes will do, as I said, as I showed then, is if one of your CDs, let's say you have four in there, if one of those CDs errors and goes down, Kubernetes will take that pod away and it will recreate that pod 
and it won't serve any traffic to it until it says that it's ready to receive traffic, until both the liveness and the readiness checks return a 200 response. Next, uh, can we deploy Sitecore Commerce using Kubernetes? Yes, you can do that today. We have <coughs> um, Kubernetes specifications that are available on dev.sitecore. You can go and do exactly what I just showed you for commerce as well. Uh, does it support the deployment in JK, GKE? GKE. Google Cloud environment, I guess that is. <laughs> um, if it is, yes, we, we support any any cloud um, any cloud runtimes like that. You can go deploy to Azure, AKS, um, Google. You can go to DigitalOcean, anything like that. Anywhere Kubernetes runs, you could go and run this. And can this also be used in uh, for site code JSS as well? Yes. Yep. So we have JSS um, asset images for the containers. So we didn't talk too much about the different containers we have today, but you could basically take our CM and CD instances, our CM and CD containers, sorry, and you can add another layer on top, which is an asset image layer. And we have asset images for JSS. So you could basically build your own JSS images and then basically go through exactly what I did. You'd edit the Kubernetes specification to point to your image instead of a default out of the box ones, and then it'll all just work. Now, uh, can you please mention some key benefits for opting Kubernetes? Some key benefits? Um, well, I think the fact I just deployed an entire Sitecore instance non-production in 14 minutes, I think it was, is pretty good. Um, I think that's pretty hard to do on PaaS or IaaS instances, or even a local development machine is rarely that fast outside of containers. Um, outside of that, there's a cost benefit involved. So the throughput and the compute resource would be more efficient. If you go back to thinking about, um, com let's compare this to PaaS. If we talk about our four CD instances I mentioned before, you're probably going to want those to sit at around 10 to 15% CPU utilization averaging, and then maybe peaking up to about 60% or something. So you've got a nice buffer on top. So the majority of the time, you've got a lot of unused compute resource there. You've also got to, di you've also got to dedicate that compute resource specifically. So you may choose P3 V2s, for example. You've got four of those in Azure. So that's quite a lot of Azure. It's quite a lot of compute resource, which is kind of sat on the bench. Whereas with Kubernetes, you can dedicate those resources across all your different instances. Because the nodes and the pods, sorry, because the pods are shared across the nodes, it means you can have a much better resource utilization. So you're not having as much resources kind of sat going to waste. So it should reduce your Azure spend. That's what we're hopefully going to prove with our performance metrics that are going to be released later this year. So uh, Rob, we have two more questions. If you have time, we can continue. Yeah, sure. So uh, first is uploads for media files or cluster files like PDF and CSV. How do we persist data in case a container fails or gets rebooted? So the concept with containers is they're quite like ephemeral in nature. So they, the, the idea is that they will get taken down, they'll get recreated. If a container fails a liveness or ready check X amount of times, I can't remember how many it's configured for by default, then Kubernetes will kill it. It'll kill it and it'll recreate it to try and um, maintain the stability of the cluster and the deployment as a whole. So the thinking behind that is that you should never deploy items into a container. That is not how it works at all. You deploy items into some form of persistent storage outside of that. So you do it into um, Azure Blob Storage, for example, or if it's in the media library, it could go into the database, but you don't want to store anything in the container because as you said, Kubernetes will destroy it, take it away, and then that data's lost, it's gone. And uh, next is, should we use Scratch version of CM and CDs on every deployment, or we should reuse the already deployed images during deployments or releases? <clears throat> so there's no concept of redeployment, really. Um, so when you do a deployment, it doesn't create, it doesn't overwrite the same existing image or the same existing pod and container. Kubernetes will just completely take the old ones away and it'll recreate new containers and new pods in their place. And, and as I said, Kubernetes can do this in a controlled manner. So it can balance out the traffic between the new and the old, but there's no concept of basically replacing one with another and keeping one around. It's um, yeah, basically the, it's an entire replacement each time, which is why you don't store things in the container. It's another point linked to that because every time you do a deployment, they all get blown away. 
and uh, last one is uh, will azure blob storage supported for media library to hold media files as we had in 9.3 um i think so um there's no reason it shouldn't i haven't looked into that module in quite a while but um yeah as, as long as the module is still available and supported for 10 there's no reason it can't work with this yeah yeah that was all the questions we got so far yep awesome so uh thank you rob and uh this was very informative session and we can sure take this forward to learn more about sidecore containers and azure kubernetes and uh thank you all participants and uh we all learn we all learn want to learn about uh, sitecore and we can uh, learn through this sessions so uh, keep follow us on twitter and uh, keep joining this sessions this will motivate us to uh, schedule more sessions like this and uh, if you have a topic and uh, you you need a platform to present your idea you we are here you can uh, use sugin as a platform and present your ideas and uh, to uh, to do that you just need to contact us uh, through this form and this form has some basic details about yourself and the session which you want to present uh, i have also posted this link in a chat window so if you have any topic any idea you want to present please contact us through this form and uh, we will plan your session in so again yep yeah so that's it thank you all thank you all for joining thank you rob for presenting wonderful Thanks session thank you for having me yeah and thank you bye